It was a dark time in television animation. Most of the cartoons from the Renaissance era of the 90s and early 2000s had run their course, or, for lack of a better word, spoiled. There were good and classic cartoons here and there throughout the 2000s, like Camp Laszlo, Foster's Home, Teen Titans, or Avatar, but they were sparse. And in between them, we literally got dozens and dozens of bad and mediocre shows. Johnny Test, Mr. Meaty, 12 Ounce Mouse, My Gym Partner's a Monkey, Pope Town, Brandy and Mr. Whiskers, Da Boom Crew, Skunk Fu, Lil Bush, Tackling the Power of Juju, Adult Party Cartoon, Barnyard, Gary the Rat, All Grown Up, and so many more. It would take hours to list them all. It got so bad, the Cartoon Network started to think that animation wasn't profitable. And well, we don't speak its name. And shows like Adventure Time and Regular Show were a distant dream. Pilots being rejected by Nickelodeon. And in the midst of it, we got this show. Phineas and Ferb. In between the Squirrel Boys and the Spaceballs the Animated Series, we got this very, very strange show. Strange because it was actually good! And because of this blip of quality, I can imagine that the show was a lot of people's childhoods when it came to television animation. Fun fact, back when it was running, this was one of my most requested shows to review, so, uh, sorry for the delay. It, it's a very good show, although I did have my problems with it. Like most people will tell you, Phineas and Ferb was very formulaic. Not Scooby-Doo levels of formulaic, but you could describe the majority of episodes like this. Phineas and Ferb are bored on a summer day. They take on this ridiculous project. Meanwhile, Perry disappears and puts on a secret agent hat to stop Dr. Doofenshmirtz. Isabella comes onto the scene, and Candace spends the rest of the episode trying to bust her brothers. But it all disappears because the two plots come together, and the Dr. Doofenshmirtz plan ends up making Phineas and Ferb's activities invisible to their parents. One time, that even happened literally. I mean, anyone who watched the show knows the phrases that are used in, like, every single episode. Hey, where's Perry? That reminds me. Where's Perry? Where's Perry? Some. Hey, where's Perry? Jason. Hey, where's Perry? They become quotable memes in their own right. That being said, the show knew when to break down the formula and subvert it, and it really used that to build a few fourth wall jokes that really hit home. But even at the best of times, I couldn't help but think that they hindered the show on some level. I mean, the best episodes of the show break away from the usual plotline entirely, like the one we're going to be talking about today. I mean, for starters, in this episode, Candace is on the same side as Phineas and Ferb, and that almost never happens otherwise. The episode starts with their father forgetting their wedding anniversary, but Candace reminds him. Of course, Phineas and Ferb decide to help. Hey, Dad, can we help? Well, I'm afraid not, unless you can perform miracles. What's your budget? I honestly forgot how funny this show could be. It's also a show that gets uh, funnier the more you understand their, um, adult jokes. Here, they learn about their mother's favorite band, Love Handle. Their father got them tickets to their farewell concert. Unfortunately, the band broke up many years ago, and that gets Phineas and Ferb to decide to get the band back together. From a documentary, Phineas and Ferb learn about where the members of Love Handle are now. Bobby Fabulous runs a hair salon, Swampy's librarian, and the lead singer, Danny, now works at a music shop. By the way, that's a clever working of the show's creators, Jeff Swampy Marsh and Dan Povenmire. Of course, Candace is initially reluctant to join up with Phineas and Ferb because show cliches, but she does relent. It's up to her to keep their mother they're busy while Phineas and Ferb get the band back together. Along the way, she lets it slip to her friend that they're reforming Love Handle, and that gets literally everybody excited. Like, literally everybody. So, with Danny, we get our first song of the episode. And to most people, I think the songs were the best aspect of the show. In an episode where Phineas and Ferb wanted to become one-hit wonders, they came up with a really catchy song that people love so much, the executives told them to put a song in every single episode. Now this could have easily crashed and burned. It wouldn't have been the first show to do something like this. But it's always been a risky venture. Coming up with a good song for each episode is a very difficult prospect, as the writers can get burned out. Uh, uh, uh. Uh. Uh -huh. Come on. It's good that the creators of the show really, really liked music. Even ignoring this episode, you could tell that they have a passion for the art. I know she's from She's a doing with me. 
Every episode takes on a new genre of music, and whether you like the songs or not, they have a clear understanding of what's going on behind them. I'm gonna enslave your minds with a predictable melody And uncomplicated rhymes But if I ask you to, you'd even change your name to Amy and the associations with each genre. Each of the songs is an affectionate parody, and I have a hard time of thinking of a genre that they didn't tackle. Everything from pop and techno to things like hip-hop and metal. I can't really think of a single song from the show that I didn't like, even in genres that I normally don't care about. And that's more than I could say for other shows. This song itself goes through multiple genres. It goes through blues and funk and metal and... So what's this? This is psychedelia. It's where the guitar solo came from. No, I mean, what's with all the colors? I have no idea. Sure you don't. Yeah. Ha! I kept learning all the powers my guitar had. I made it go waka waka till it was so good it was bad. Dan is convinced to rejoin the band, but the others don't prove to be so easy. Especially because the bass player is their mother's hairdresser, and she's at the place right at that moment. It's amazing how they can keep up the tension with a song, when songs in most cases seem to drop tension. Especially songs this catchy. You're the one, yes, you're the star. We need you back on bass guitar. You're fabulous. I'm fabulous. You're fabulous. I'm fabulous. Maybe it's because of all the background gags and small quips. You're the one who sets the bar. And the final stop is the library. Apparently, Swampy fell asleep in a metronome factory and lost his sense of rhythm. Despite that, we end up getting the best song in the episode. All these sweet old ladies in this carpet from the 80s will have mocha the librarian need. Cause I ain't got rhythm. No, I ain't got rhythm. Said I ain't got rhythm. I ain't got rhythm. I don't think he ever lost his sense of rhythm in the first place. I mean, this song was nominated for an Emmy. Then again, four songs total from the show had gotten nominated. Meanwhile, Lawrence's anniversary plan seems to have fallen through. That is until Phineas and Fur bring the band around. Although it immediately seems like they're at each other's throats once again. It gets to the point where it looks like Danny is about to leave. What about your fans? Phineas, I admire your optimism. But besides your dad, be honest. What fans? And it comes together with the final song, which, while the lyrics sound pretty cheesy here and there, it, it's a perfect summation of how ridiculous this type of music can actually get. I can actually imagine this kind of song playing in the 80s. The ending of the episode is very satisfying, and it connects flawlessly to the rest of the episode. In fact, the entire episode flows very well. It's 22 minutes long, but it feels a lot like an 11-minute episode with how everything comes together. And that's not even to mention the subplot, which has also taken a subversion from its normal formula. It starts normally with Perry the Platypus being called away to stop the evil Dr. Doofenshmirtz, but that quickly changes when it doesn't seem to be a domination plot to take over the tri-state area. It deals with the doctor trying to create a birthday party for 16-year-old daughter Vanessa. The the problem is that he seems to be hung up on the past and keeps making her little girl's parties. Now normally, I really hate the dumbass dad trope. I've ranted on this before and I'm probably going to do it again at some point. It's been an inescapable stereotype since the 90s and it hasn't been funny since. It tires me and even shows that I've liked, like Gumball. I'm not offended by it, it's just that every single joke with this character type has long been since done. However, I think that this is one of the best portrayals, like season 2 and 3 Homer Simpson good. And I could definitely forgive this portrayal in particular. I don't know if this is the... But Dr. Doofenshmirtz seems more earnest than your usual dumbass dad. He actually tries to do good, and his attempts come from a place that you can sympathize with. It puts him on a higher place than, say, Peter Griffin or Glenn Martin, where their attempts come out of complete self-absorption. Having a hard time realizing that your child is growing up is a thing that many real parents struggle with, and it's a very understandable thing for Dr. Doof to do. Not to mention that otherwise, he's a bit more intelligent than your typical dumbass dad. Beyond the genius things, he doesn't set himself on fire as much as, say, Homer Simpson. 
His stories also showcase how good Phineas and Ferb is at showing more relationships than your typical nuclear family. Dr. Doofenshmirtz is divorced. It's not a focus of any particular episode, but you can see how it affects his dynamic with Vanessa and his ex-wife when it does come up. And let's not forget that Phineas and Ferb are actually stepbrothers, which is, or was, unusual for the main cast of the cartoon family. Actually, I think that's still pretty unusual. I didn't talk about the subplot until the end because it really would have harmed the flow of this review. Oddly enough, when the pacing of a plot and subplot are as good as they are here in this episode, it makes it seem very jarring and back and forth to talk about in a review context. Especially because the stories are quite simple. Phineas and Ferb tell simple stories. That's not a bad thing. And on top of that, stories are usually even more simple than usual in musical episodes. There aren't many plot points to talk about. It's really fascinating that this show came out when it did. Like I said, television animation was kind of awful around the time. And to tell you the truth, I was almost done with cartoons at this point. And Phineas and Ferb really helped to change my perspective. A lot of early 2000s or 90s kids probably went through a similar phase where they thought they were getting too old for animation because it wasn't in our imagination. Television animation really was going down the toilet in the late 2000s. There was a noticeable decline in quality around that time. It's much better now, but take 2009 for instance. That is probably the single worst year in television animation in history. Archer was the only good cartoon that aired that year. One show, out of dozens, at least I think there may have been dozens, Cartoon Network released literally no cartoons that year. And instead, they decided to release five live action shows. Fox had aired The Cleveland Show, which didn't need to exist. SpongeBob and Family Guy were showing their age, and Nickelodeon released Fanboy and Chum Chum. And let's not forget whatever the fuck this thing was. <laughs> Phineas and Ferb was a great cartoon in a very, very dark era. I won't say that it saved the medium or anything, but it definitely pulled more than its weight in a time after Ed and Eddie ended and before Adventure Time started. There are so many good things to mention about this show. The stories are simple, but not to a fault. The humor is pretty good, and the songs are really fun. If I ever made a top 10 musical numbers from cartoons, Phineas and Ferb could take up a lot of those slots. And every once in a while, I can come up with these really heartwarming episodes. Speaking of which, next time we get to talk about an episode from another show that still proves it can hit amazing heights, even in its fifth season. We'll be talking about the Gumball episode, The Choices. One of their most recent episodes, and recently, my favorite episode of that show. It was a dark time in television animation. Most of the cartoons from the Renaissance era of the 90s and early 2000s had run their course, or for lack of a better word, spoiled. There were good and classic cartoons here and there throughout the 2000s, like Camp Laszlo, Foster's Home, Teen Titans, or Avatar, but they were sparse. And in between them, we literally got dozens and dozens of bad and mediocre shows. Johnny Test, Mr. Meaty, 12 Ounce Mouse, My Gym Partner's a Monkey, Pope Town, Brandy and Mr. Whiskers, Da Boom Crew, Skunk Fu, Lil Bush, Tag and the Power of Juju, Adult Party Cartoon, Barnyard, Gary the Rat, All Grown Up, and so many more. It would take hours to list them all. It got got so bad, the Cartoon Network started to think that animation wasn't profitable. And well, we don't speak its name. And shows like Adventure Time and Regular Show were a distant dream. Pilots being rejected by Nickelodeon. And in the midst of it, we got this show, Phineas and Ferb. In between the Squirrel Boys and the Spaceballs the Animated Series, we got this very, very strange show. Strange because it was actually good! And because of this blip of quality, I can imagine that the show was a lot of people's childhoods when it came to television animation. Fun fact, back when it was running, this was one of my most requested shows to review, so, uh, sorry for the delay. It, it's a very good show, although I did have my problems with it. Like most people will tell you, Phineas and Ferb was very formulaic. Not Scooby-Doo levels of formulaic, but you could describe the majority of episodes like this. Phineas and Ferb are bored on a summer day. They take on this ridiculous project. Meanwhile, Perry disappears and puts on a secret agent hat to stop Dr. Doofenshmirtz. Isabella comes onto the scene, and Candace spends the rest of the episode trying to bust her brothers. But it all disappears because the two plots come together, and the Dr. Doofenshmirtz plan ends up making Phineas and Ferb's activities invisible to their parents. One time, that even happened literally. I mean, anyone who watched the show knows the phrases that are used in, like, every single episode. Hey, where's Perry? That reminds me. Where's Perry? Where's Perry? Some. Hey, where's Perry? Hey, where's Perry? 
they become quotable memes in their own right. That being said, the show knew when to break down the formula and subvert it, and it really used that to build a few fourth wall jokes that really hit home. But even at the best of times, I couldn't help but think that they hindered the show on some level. I mean, the best episodes of the show break away from the usual plotline entirely, like the one we're going to be talking about today. I mean, for starters, in this episode, Candace is on the same side as Phineas and Ferb, and that almost never happens otherwise. The episode starts with their father forgetting their wedding anniversary, but Candace reminds him. Of course, Phineas and Ferb decide to help. Hey Dad, can we help? Well, I'm afraid not, unless you can perform miracles. What's your budget? I honestly forgot how funny this show could be. It's also a show that gets uh, funnier the more you understand their, um, adult jokes. Here they learn about their mother's favorite band, Love Handle. Their father got them tickets to their farewell concert. Unfortunately, the band broke up many years ago, and that gets Phineas and Ferb to decide to get the band back together. From a documentary, Phineas and Ferb learn about where the members of Love Handle are now. Bobby Fabulous runs a hair salon, Swampy's librarian, and the lead singer, Danny, now works at a music shop. By the way, that's a clever working of the show's creators, Jeff Swampy Marsh and Dan Povenmeyer. Of course, Candace is initially reluctant to join up with Phineas and Ferb because show cliches, but she does relent. It's up to her to keep their mother busy while Phineas and Ferb get the band back together. Along the way, she lets it slip to her friend that they're reforming Love Handle, and that gets literally everybody excited. Like, literally everybody. So, with Danny, we get our first song of the episode. And to most people, I think the songs were the best 